This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Feinberg. In mid-March, the early days of Chicago's COVID-19 outbreak, many older adults with multiple chronic conditions didn't think the disease would affect them and reported not changing their behaviors. This according to the results of a Northwestern Medicine study recently published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The paper also details disparities that emerged by race and social status. Michael Wolf led this study. He is the Associate Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine at Feinberg and Director of the Center for Applied Health Research on Aging in our Institute for Public Health and Medicine. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Wolf. Thank you. Your team decided to track awareness of COVID-19 for high-risk individuals throughout the pandemic. Just tell me a little bit about your team's concern and why this survey was created. Sure. So our Center for Applied Health Research on Aging, or CARA as we call it for short, Um, Most of the work that we do to date has been focused on middle-aged and older adults and how they manage their chronic conditions. And given that there's been such a tension on with COVID-19, that those who are at the highest levels of risk are those who are over the age of 60, those with underlying health conditions, we naturally thought there was an opportunity for us to understand how they were kind of becoming aware of the pandemic, uh, if they had actual knowledge uh, to basically prevent their risk and the spread of the infection and also what they were doing to kind of think about taking care of their their own health during this time. And and so we really wanted to just tap into that at the very beginning. And so early in March, when we were just, you know, hearing all of these mixed messages um, at different levels of government um, and some downplaying uh, the seriousness of the the pandemic and also really in action at the time. There was no shelter in place when we first started the study. There was only 46 cases and zero deaths the week that we launched into it. Um, we were really concerned that maybe the, the really significance or the salience of the message was not being heard in terms uh, of really needing to take preemptive steps to, to really shelter in place, social distance, um, keep themselves, you know, manage hygiene, do what you can to avoid the healthcare system to some regard, especially yeah. that. It. So that's really why we we took it to kind of to heart because a lot of the people that we've been doing research with for so long uh, are are probably at the greatest risk and we were wondering if they'd get harmed by the, the lack of a consistent public health message. So you designed this study, share the background of the participants in this study, how you reached them and what you asked them. Sure, and we did this really fast. Um, it was the only way to really kind of capture it because every day, if you remember back in mid-March, would probably feels like oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> Um, it was things were increasing, uh, cases were increasing about 50% a day in, in, in the in, in Illinois area. And so what we did really quickly is we took five studies, all federally funded. All of them had patients that were predominantly older. Um, all of them had one or more chronic conditions. Two thirds or more had um, three or more chronic conditions or multiple chronic conditions. And by design, we looked at these people and since they were all active, we all had a common data set on them in which we had uniformly collected demographic information, health status information, um, other kind of attributes that would be important in thinking about how they, you know, that might determine whether or not they took action early or not. And because we could do this quickly, we didn't have to collect a lot of the extra data. We designed a survey modeled after some earlier swine flu uh, surveys that had been conducted back in 2009. And when we sent our workforce home, our research team, all went remote, we blasted out about 130 uh, surveys a day for uh, six days and got a very large sample, which created the cohort that we have now called the Chicago COVID-19 comorbidities or the C3 survey. And many of these people, they have a lot of health conditions, lung disease. Mm -hmm. These are folks who might have kidney transplants, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. Um, So this really... You said these people are really in that vulnerable position. Kidney transplants with, you know, who are, you know, have compromised immune systems and, you know, lots Mm. of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as you said it, hypertension and type 2 diabetes, you know, the full range of cardiovascular uh, conditions. So it was, it's a very, a group with a lot of um, uh, complicated uh, health uh, conditions. And you really wanted to understand their awareness of COVID-19 and there were um, three items that you asked participants. Can you tell me a little bit about those items? Yeah, so the first thing we just wanted people to do was just kind of rank on a scale of one to 10, you know, how serious did they perceive the threat of COVID-19? And the next question we really 
kind of focused in on was whether or not they thought they would get sick or that someone that they they knew would get sick mm -hmm. uh, or caps get the infection um and that was probably the the most and then we also asked them how worried they were um about uh, the threat of of COVID-19 to them personally. So that captured the awareness piece of it. And you found that most people, you know, they were concerned about COVID-19, but many seemed to lack the critical knowledge about the virus and they were not changing routines or plans. Just explain those main results to me and what you found. While they all had concern for COVID-19, a lot of people did not think that they would, that they had, it was likely at all that they would get COVID-19. And then when you get to the knowledge piece, as you asked, we really kind of thought of knowledge in two buckets. The first was, uh, and we made them demonstrate that they actually knew. So we had, we basically took their open-ended responses when we said, can you name three symptoms of COVID-19? And that was to see, could they recognize it? And at the time, the CDC was really focusing in on the, the real trifecta of the symptoms that were most recognized at the time, which was shortness of breath, uh, fever, and a dry cough. Uh, we captured anything that they would say and then had five independent clinicians, all um, physicians ranging from geriatrics to transplant to internal medicine, independently rating these reviews and kind of reconciling what would be correct or not. And then the second bucket was, can you name three ways in which you can prevent um, the infection of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, asking, looking, were they talking about social distancing? Um, were they thinking about washing their hands, um, avoiding people who are ill, and, and other things to that regard that were also on the CDC website? And again, that was independently rated as correct or incorrect by by our clinician uh, colleagues. What you found was that they didn't think that they would get it, and they also weren't changing how they were mm -hmm kind of going about life at this point. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, and on the knowledge, one third didn't, uh, could not name three symptoms of COVID and one third couldn't name three ways to prevent it. And then when we got to asking, are you, you know, is your daily routine changing a lot? Um, you know, one in five uh, you know, participants in the survey said that their daily routine wasn't changing a lot and that they were not um, changing made plans uh, accordingly, you know, which would include social distancing or other ways to be preemptive and in, in thinking about, um, you know, sheltering in place and other things that were coming down the pike to prevent their uh, potential harm. And talking about social distancing, you know, these are folks that live in Chicago. It's the third largest city in the nation. And changing behaviors like social distancing may be actually hard for some of these people, even if they weren't planning on doing it. Um, can you tell me, do you think social distancing is realistic for everyone in these high-risk populations? Well, that's the sad truth is it's not going to be very easy. You know, many of these people, while older, were still working. Um, and, and what we're learning right now that, that hasn't been in this first paper, but again, this, this is an ongoing survey, is you've got people who are also having changes in their employment um, that are likely happening as a result, as you can see what's happening to our economy based on the pandemic. So if you have to work, if you have to take public transportation that you rely on, if uh, there may be just ways in which you can't social distance, um, if you are living in a household in which you um, have, uh, you know, whether it be a multi-generational family or just a number of people um, that you can't, you know, uh, avoid right. <laughs> or in a yeah, public housing. I mean, I think this is a real problem that uh, where uh, the message sounds very simple and straightforward and it's a simple call to everybody to, to shelter in place, but that may not be effective at reducing your personal risk if, if your social circumstance doesn't allow it. Tell me about the disparities by race and social status that emerged in the survey. You're touching on it a bit there, but you did find a few interesting pieces in the survey. Yeah, you know, like there's three things that seem to really emerge, you know, um, one that um, first off, there were no racial or uh, racial disparities um, specifically by uh, how you perceive the threat. Everyone perceived the threat of COVID-19 as high. Mm -hmm. There were no racial disparities by what you knew, um, how to identify it, how to prevent it. Um, but there were disparities in, uh, in by race and by social status and also by health literacy, which is kind of a, uh, your kind of operational skill set on how you can understand and take action on health information. And again, in this case, the public health messaging that was out and about on what you should be doing to prevent risk. So people who uh, were black, who were living below the poverty level, and people with low health literacy um, all thought they were less likely to get sick from the, from COVID-19. They basically said that there's not it's not at all likely that they'll get it. 
So their awareness or perception of, of risk in some regards, or of susceptibility in this case, um, was lower. Mm. And then on top of that, you the you know we we saw differences in preparedness, not so much in behavior. So we did not see again back to like the knowledge and the the perception of threat. Racial disparities did not fall into play when we asked if they were changing behaviors or plans, but it did really hit home when we asked them how prepared they felt they would be able to handle. Uh, an outbreak of, of COVID-19. And um, again, black participants and those living below poverty level felt they were less prepared. Yeah. And again, this might tie back into that message that, and also to that regard, also those with lower health literacy skills. Um, and it might tie back to this notion that um, I'm doing what I can do and I know what I should be doing and I am worried about it. But at the same time, if my social circumstance, if I still have to go to work and, I'll, and the nature of the work might put you at, at harm's way, um, as we're seeing and hearing about it, a lot of people who are essential workers um, are still kind of being put in harm's way. Um, that may play into this. Um, what is interesting on a, on a final note to, to our findings in terms of prep preparedness is less than 10% of our, of our participants were very confident in the federal government response. Individuals with the lowest health literacy levels were the ones that were most uh, confident in the federal government response. So just because that was what also was very alarming at this really initial outbreak with a lot of conflicting messaging around public health and what you're supposed to be doing with COVID-19 um, and kind of the slow to start actions that we were seeing, uh, and this is before shelter in place outside of a right. few Western states. Um, that's where we thought, you know, overall people, there was definitely um, a, a perception that uh, maybe we aren't prepared as a country to be managing this pandemic. So 30% of people in Chicago are African American, and it's been reported that so far 70% of deaths due to the COVID-19 here in Chicago are of Black people. Do you anticipate seeing similar results in the survey when you reach back out to these folks again that more Black Chicagoans have been affected? You know, that seems to be what the story is playing out right now. In our survey, so just as an aside, we're going to be looking at this cohort. We've already looked at them a second wave, mm -hmm. um, and that those results are have already been kind of uh, moved forward for publication. And, and we're looking uh, to do a third wave, which might be after the apex of the of the COVID outbreak in Chicago, or hopefully, and that'll be in early May. And then again, 12 weeks from our baseline, uh, which would be set for more like in the July area, uh, to really kind of track not only just the attitudes, but also the behaviors, but then because we have the ability to link into electronic health record, we should be able to take a peek to look at whether or not they develop COVID-19. Um, or even if they were tested for COVID-19 and so they felt they're symptomatic, uh, what the results of the test were, um, if they're positive, if they're hospitalized in any COVID or non-COVID related health outcome that we might be able to tap into. We're concerned on a bunch of levels. We're wondering, you know, do we see the same disparity in our sample as the city is playing out where this disproportionate number of individuals who are Black, maybe of lower social, social status that um, are, are more adversely affected? Uh, but we're also beyond COVID-19, we're, we're also concerned that could we see disparities that are non-COVID disparities, but as the result of COVID-19 in Chicago, uh, is there a widening of disparities in terms of health outcomes for all of these individuals who talk yeah. about have two or three chronic conditions? And how well is it being managed? Are certain individuals more infrequently use healthcare, cancel appointments, um, or not be able to access healthcare services that are needed for them or get blood work done and other things. So it's, it's really going to be concerning for us to make sure that these people who really do need um, to utilize healthcare more routinely um, for the complexity of their care, um, that if this disparity widens, we'll definitely need to be thinking about a response. You mentioned the swine flu of 2009 earlier in this interview and um, that you used similar questions in a survey. And there were also similar results reported um, in those 2009 surveys. Why do you think these attitudes persist? There's probably some aspect um, of history that's kind of at play, you know, and, and with the Black community, I think there's a lot of issues of, of trust in uh, how you use the healthcare system and, and the well, how well the healthcare system uh, in the U.S. actually um, serves um, certain communities, and I think that's 
maybe an underlying current that, that had been thought of previously in, in prior pandemics as it's played out in multiple times, uh, this, these kind of disparities both by, by race and social status. There's also the informational sources might likely come into it in terms of the quality of the information that's being put out, um, the sources of information, uh, where you get your information, um, what's being heard, um, and, and the level of community action, I think, is the other thing that we're, we're looking into. In the 2009 H1N1 uh, swine flu outbreak, a lot of uh, determinants of, of you know, maybe misinformation or misbeliefs were based on the number of sources of information you tapped into, where you were getting the information in social media. Um, that did come into play as, as kind of a, a root cause of, of some of the inequities that we were, we were seeing back then. In our second wave of the study, and I, I'm going to mention uh, Dr. Stacy Bailey, uh, who is um, um, my close research colleague within our Center for Applied Health Research and Aging, and also directs the Health Literacy and Learning Program uh, at Northwestern. Um, she's added more information into really getting at the granularity around how people are accessing health um, health information around COVID-19. How many hours a day are they listening to it? How does that affect their level of concern? Um, and also, what sources are they going to? Because it's it's not just about um, you know whether you're going to the internet or listening on the TV or on the radio, or if it's coming for friends or family. It's it's specifically what channel. Um, it's specifically what website. Um, because there's a lot of conflicting guidance that has been put out there. And I think that's going to be a very big determinant of what we see playing out in some of these uh, disparities that we're talking about. What public health efforts could help inform and protect these folks in the most vulnerable communities? You mentioned, you know, there's a lot of conflicting information out there. Is there something that we uh, could be doing that we aren't? I think there's some really nice actions that are taking place right now. I was very um, happy to hear just the other day, if not even yesterday. Again, it's kind of hard to remember what day of the week it is these these days. But right. you know, to hear the mayor um, Lori Lightfoot talk about you know increased testing happening in the South Side in, in specific uh, more vulnerable communities. I've been ramping at the daily testing rates up, so I think they're at least really trying to put a more public health proactive. Um, focus on looking for some of these kind of clusters, these areas that seem to be at greatest risk. And I think that's going to be one important step. A lot of community action um, uh, could be taking place in terms of, you know, really trying to mobilize at the shoe leather level, as you would say, you know, really pounding the pavement to really get into some of these communities that may be um, in some cases more remote, but within households have greater population density that you, uh, that creates risk or people having to, you know, again, um, who are using public transportation, who can't socially isolate. I think there's got to be more creative ways for us to really, you know, think about what's keeping, uh, you know, certain groups um, who may be more compromised, um, who uh, may not be getting the message, who cannot do, even if they're getting the message, are unable to, unable to do it, how do we help them protect themselves? And there's a lot of yeah. ways we could be doing it. And it's not just about messaging, but part of it will clearly be that case. And if, if it's also, how do you get um, needed supplies um, and ways in which you, people who can't necessarily socially distance, whether it be face masks or, or other kind of um, PPE for not for essential workers who I think that label is being expanded as as we speak to recognize there's a lot of people who are in positions that may be um, in terms of wage lower income earning positions that are still going to be at risk and they don't have ways to protect themselves and I think that's where the public health measures are going to have to start to gravitate as well too and as you said we aren't even at the apex of this yet, there's definitely more to come from the folks that you're surveying and just uh, more to come to see how this is going to play out. Stay tuned. I think, you know, the, the C3 study continues and uh, we have four waves that are set right now. And then the fact that we can tie this into the electronic health records and start to really kind of really understand, um, you know, if, if this kind of widens the disparity and hopefully help us, helps our mobilize our health system a little bit more so we uh, can start to understand how to better use telehealth and all these other resources that are really going to be kind of the, whether it's the consequences or, or maybe the, the, the benefits in some odd way of, of the post um, wave one COVID-19 outbreak. Well, it certainly feels like a brave new world, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And we're going to look forward to these coming studies. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Make sure that you subscribe to the Breakthroughs podcast so that you can hear the latest on COVID-19 research from Feinberg scientists and about other Feinberg research. Also, rate us on Apple Podcasts.